Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. January 30th was not a good day for me. It started out slow, like any other work day. I was just going about my business until about 6.50 in the morning when I realized that I had a 7 a.m. meeting that I was required to attend. This should have been an omen to me, but I thought it was a normal day. And so three hours after that, I realized that there were prospective buyers that were going to be coming in and out of our apartment complex to see the different units. You can imagine how an introvert like me processes and accepts a disruption like that. I spent my entire workday in my apartment answering emails, getting status updates, getting answers of no, followed by yes, followed by no, followed by yes, and then even more and more disruptions. Approximately 10 minutes before my workday was to end, and I thought the day would be over with, I received yet another bit of bad news, and that was I needed to compose a set of five, six, seven emails with details and details to be sent to our offshore team before they started their next day of work. I didn't get the opportunity to do that just then because I had two hours to read three or four chapters for a class that I had a video conference on that I probably wouldn't remember what I had just read. After said video conference, I logged back on to work, did some more stuff, and then had to figure out if there was anything else for me to turn in that day. Side note, the next morning, I discovered there was a typo between the syllabus and the online portal for yet another class, and I had missed a deadline. You can't relate to that, can you? Those kinds of situations where life just seems to be a mess. So before we jump into our text this morning, which I didn't select, Sarah did, I do want to acknowledge that we normally are talking about the resurrection when we come to these final chapters in the Gospels. But we're not today going to be talking about Easter or resurrection or any of that kind of theology. We're going to cover all of that after Lent. But today, we're, we're finishing up our series on the living a life of Zoe. Zoe being the Greek translation for the word life, and sometimes used as the Greek equivalent for the first created woman, Eve. And I apologize. And on disruption, so we're handing you a mic. Yay! <laughs> Guys, we set this up as he's an intern at Claremont. He's learning what to do when things go weird. He's doing well, right? There you go. I sure am. That's got to be it. Okay, so next, next time I will have to slice my hair off, I suppose. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love the book of Judges. I'll have to preach on that sometime. So today we're finishing up our series on living a life of Zoe. Sometimes that's translated as the name for Eve, the first woman created in the book of Genesis. Jesus told his followers that he came to give them life and that they might have it abundantly. So how exactly do we do that when situations and life seem to work against us? That's what we're going to explore today. So let's take a look at our text first. Right from the beginning, what we encounter is a mess. Maybe even some possible signals of confusion. The opening words of chapter 28 are literally translated as late on the Sabbath at dawn. Now that probably doesn't strike us as odd until we recognize that in Jewish culture, the Sabbath technically ended at sundown. So this would really, to us in our modern understanding, This might be similar to someone saying, oh, I was out too late this morning. 
at which point he would recognize they were a hot mess and you would offer them some black coffee. But it's not just these first words of this chapter that are a little odd. The women come to see the tomb. And the Greek word here for see implies a special understanding or insight. And that almost suggests that the women were expecting to see a resurrection. All of the gospel accounts record that it was women who were the first to arrive at the tomb. But in ancient societies, only men were allowed to provide testimony or an accounting of events. Thanks, patriarchy. But from the text, we can't really tell if having female witnesses is some form of reverse psychology or if it's an attempt to honor the most early witnesses on that morning. We barely get much farther in the text before we read about a great earthquake. Now, some theologians speculate that this was an aftershock of an earthquake from verse 51 in the previous chapter. Others suggest that it was an earthquake from the stone rolling away, but Matthew says that it was the angel who rolled the stone away. On top of this, though, you have to feel bad for the guards, right? I mean, they're just doing their jobs when this super shiny, bright guy in white clothes shows up. It almost literally scares them to death, which is also messed up in a way because they're guarding the guy who is supposed to be dead. Spoiler alert. They end up being the ones that are mistaken for dead. Now, we know that the guards were scared, but at the outset, the book of Matthew doesn't tell us that the women were. It's probably just assumed when the angel says, do not be afraid Then the angel also invites them to come and look at the empty tomb. But again, we're not told whether they do or not. This entire chapter just goes back and forth, assuming, not assuming, saying one thing, presuming another. It's one giant, confusing mess. So the women are hurrying off to tell the disciples, and Jesus appears to them and says, Greetings. What was interesting in my study is that the word for greetings is not some sophisticated greetings and salutations, like Jesus was wearing a monocle and a top hat. Instead, the Greek word is a very casual form of greeting, almost as Jesus came around the corner and said, hey, there's a lot that's going on in these short 10 verses that we have this morning. But what is present here is more than just resurrection. Like much of our sacred texts, we get to take what is written, what is given. We take our own lived experiences and we make our own meaning. We have to make meaning out of the mess that life gives us, out of discipleship, out of our own lives. Even church can be messy. Take this microphone for an example. I know that for me, at least, I get caught up in these neat, tidy ideas of how faith or how life ought to work. And at every turn, we experience disruption. There's this story of a Sunday school teacher who brings out construction paper and crayons and allows the students to draw and create and to color. But over in the corner, there's a little girl, and she's coloring furiously, drawing big circles with lots of different colors and broad strokes. And the teacher approaches her and says, oh, what a pretty, lovely, inter... What is it that you're coloring? (laughs) And the little girl says, I'm coloring God. And the teacher, obviously confused, says, oh, that's nice. How do you know what God looks like? And the little girl, completely unfazed, says, when I'm done coloring, we'll know. Duh. (laughs) Kids' artwork can be messy, much like our lives. And they think that it's totally great. But they don't always stay inside the lines. 
They may not use the shades or the colors that make sense. They might even ask you to put it up on the refrigerator. Kids don't have all the answers. And sometimes, I think neither do adults. We get caught up in what we think we know. We forget to be open to what God would have for us to discover. There's a messiness to what we experience. Sometimes, even when we are trying to make sense of our lives in hindsight, we have to embrace that messiness as we tell our stories to others. Dr. Jared Pollack, a neuropsychologist at Seacoast Medical Health Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, recounts a story about him and his wife as they survey their 15-year-old daughter's bedroom in order to assess what needed to be done. The bedroom was a complete picture of utter disorder, but also individuality. He says, One day I'm standing in front of the door, and it's out of control, and my wife Dana is freaking out. And suddenly I see in all the piles the dress that she wore to her first dance, and an earring that she wore to her bat mitzvah. She's so trusting her journal is just laying out in the open, wide open on the floor. And there are photo booth pictures of her seven friends strewn everywhere. I said, oh my gosh, her cup overflows. And we started to laugh. He said, the room was an invitation to search for a deeper meaning under the surface. How can we shift our perspectives to see Jesus in the mess? A Catholic author, Flannery O'Connor, was known for finding God in human messiness. She wrote dark dramas with ugly characters and gloomy endings. If you're like me and you enjoy happy endings, you would not like her stories, which include an escaped con man who murders an entire family out on a country drive, or a traveling Bible salesman who steals a woman's wooden leg. Referring to this dark characterization of her works, Ms. O'Connor said, evil is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be endured. She talked about these stories, as well as her own lived experience of living in the South, as not so much being Christ-centered, but Christ-haunted. Journalist Ted Rosian noted of her, O'Connor found the messy circumstances of human life not void of God's presence, but the very place where grace often enters. Her work should suggest that there is more at risk when we turn our heads away from the world, preferring to store our view of God piously elsewhere. He goes on to quote O'Connor herself, It is where the individual's faith is weak, not when it is strong, that he will be afraid of an honest, fictional representation of life. And when there is a tendency to compartmentalize the spiritual and make it resident in a certain type of life only, the sense of the supernatural is apt to be gradually lost. I wonder... In our quest to be so structured, organized, prepared, are we chipping away at our ability to perceive God? Is it possible for us to relax and sit in the messiness that life has to offer? Much as the angel said to the women who approached this tomb, I say to you this morning, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of the messiness. We get nervous and anxious when things go awry, but our faith shows us that there is more beneath the chaos. As we journey through Lent, things are going to get messy. Like the women in our passage, we may feel like things are so crazy that we need to grab Jesus' ankles, something to hold on to. We may start questioning, what are we doing here? Or if there's even a point. But no matter where we go or how far we travel, 
Jesus is not far away. And that, my friends, is exactly what we need when life gets messy. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, whose name is love, we thank you for the countless blessings that find their way into our lives, even in the midst of messiness, for the awesome opportunity they present in encountering Jesus, and for the unique ways we can experience your divine presence. Help us to let go of ourselves, of the things that we think we know, and to release our narrow expectations for the way you show up in our lives. Grant us peace. Help us to love. Bless us to live. For we ask all these things in your holy name. Amen.